I want to help introduce the co-founder of the Freedom Summit, Mr. Mark Victor, who's going to uh, uh, open up our 2018 Freedom Summit. Mr. Mark Victor. So can you guys hear me okay? At risk of damaging my Patriots tie here. Come on. You guys hear me okay now? Anybody not able to hear me? Cam, you can hear me in the back? All right, well. I'm glad to trade places with them. Okay. Roy Miller has an offer for somebody who can't hear. So anyways, it's true. My name is Mark Victor. That is exactly what my mom told me. And so uh, first, I want to welcome you to the Freedom Summit. And uh, I want to thank ASU. Where's Chris? Chris is out of the room. We, we couldn't do this without ASU. It'd certainly be a lot harder. And so uh, I, I very much appreciate ASU. Think about that. A somewhat mainstream uh, state university is allowing us to host this radical, pro-freedom, pro-liberty kind of event. And so I want to make sure uh, we give a hand to Chris for making this happen. That's Chris over there. He's the ASU person in the room. Bold enough to say I'm going to bring a bunch of people here, who some of whom call themselves anarcho-capitalists and all kinds of other weird things like voluntarists. I also want to thank Cam from my office. Cam, put your hand up. Did tons of work to make this Freedom Summit possible. Mike over there, my buddy of, I don't know, 75 years or so. We've been friends. And also Stephanie. I don't know where Stephanie is from my office. Um, these people in my office are hardcore pro-freedom people. I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, but my law office used to be called the law firm of Mark J. Victor PC. It is no longer called the law firm of Mark J. Victor PC because I wanted a bunch of rabid, pro-freedom, wild warriors at my firm as lawyers. And I don't hire them unless they are. And so uh, the name of our firm has changed to the Attorneys for Freedom law firm, uh, not wanting to be a fraud in any way, because anybody can say they're for freedom, right? I mean, who, who here is for freedom? Everybody's for freedom. But don't get too excited about yourself here, because I ask this question every group I speak to. And it doesn't matter if I speak to the socialist group, the communist group, or I admit the Republicans and the Democrats. <laughs> they all say they're for freedom, right? Barack was for freedom. Trump is for freedom. Kim Jong-un, I'm sure he's for freedom. Hitler said he was for freedom. Mussolini's for freedom. You get the idea. I want to thank you guys and the speakers, some of whom have already started coming in, because without you guys and without the speakers, we don't get to have this conference about freedom. This thing got started a long time ago. Some of you were there. I think Rick Fisher may have been at the first one. It was 2001, and I had said to Ernie Hancock, I don't want to travel all over the United States to go to a freedom conference. It's a real pain in the neck for me, but I really want to go to these things. So what we decided to do was bring the conference to us, which allows us to hand select the speakers. And I only pick the people who I think are the best about freedom. I don't like freedom whips. I like hardcore, principled, pro-freedom speakers. And I think that's what we got for you this weekend. I'm really excited about that. As soon as we basically announced the Freedom Summit back in 2001. September 11th happened, and everybody was afraid to go into big groups or to be gather at any big gathering, but we decided to forge ahead, and uh, we forged ahead for many years, and then we stopped doing it for a while. I think that uh, Ernie and I got a little bit frustrated. I mean, one might say this really ought to be held at the, at the uh, convention center. This ought to be something where we have 100,000 people especially in the era of Donald Trump. But nonetheless, we go forward. And we go forward no matter how small of a group we are, because we're doing the most important work in society. So this conference is really about celebrating and promoting freedom. Now when we talk about freedom, because everybody's for freedom, everybody's for freedom in a way that it doesn't really mean anything anymore. I mean, what does it mean to be for freedom, to be pro-freedom. It doesn't mean, at least in my view, the way I use the word, it doesn't mean you're free to live at the expense of another human being. 
Most of those people who raise their hand when I ask that question, I think that's part of their definition of freedom. It also doesn't mean that you're free to do whatever you want. I'm not, freedom doesn't mean I get to go punch somebody in the face. Freedom comes with responsibilities, right? We understand what freedom is about. It's a right and it comes with responsibilities. It's a principle. It means we stand for something. If we're for anything, we're for this thing that is so lovingly referred to as the non-aggression principle. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, sorry, and I don't mean this as an insult, you're probably not really for freedom because you don't even understand what freedom is about yet. So what is this non-aggression principle? And by the way, this is just my warm-up. I'm giving a speech tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. that I hope you don't miss. But I wanted to introduce some of the concepts of freedom. This non-aggression principle, I've heard it expressed many different ways. And I'm not really fussy about it as long as we're getting at the same thing. What we're talking about is we are against the initiation of force or violence or coercion. Does it mean we're pacifists? No. You can be if you like, but you don't have to be. We're against the initiation of force. We're not against self-defense. That seems to be an important principle. Why don't people agree with this principle? Another way of expressing it is, I'm in charge of me, you're in charge of you. I, us I usually can get people to agree with things like this. I don't think I've said anything radically controversial, have I? I mean, initiating force is bad against other human beings. Anybody have a problem with that? Fraud, coercion, that's really all we're saying here. I'm saying, I own me. If I don't own me, somebody else can do whatever they want. If you don't own you, I can lay a claim. You become a slave to some extent. If we don't at least assert that we own ourselves, I'm in charge. I'm the iron-fisted dictator of this body. I don't want to ask anybody's permission. I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm in charge of me. I decide what I do with this body. I decide what I put in this body or what I don't put in this body. I decide where it goes, how it's used. Is that really so radical? Is it really so, I mean, it may be, it's certainly illegal and this is not, a, this is the point that is not agreed to by the non-libertarians, by the people who don't accept the non-aggression principle. I think this is a point worth fighting for. There is still slavery. We're still slaves if we don't own ourselves. We are part of the anti-slavery movement. And it hasn't been brought to a conclusion yet. Some people express it in terms of voluntary associations. They call themselves fancy names. I'm a voluntarist. Okay, I like that. If it's voluntary and it's between consenting adults, who cares, right? It should be legal is all we're saying. It doesn't mean I'm passing on the morality of the thing. I may say something is completely immoral, but if it's a voluntary interaction between consenting adults, it's none of my damn business. Is this so radical? I mean, yes, I like it when people call me a radical libertarian. I, I tend to like the word radical as it's applied to me, and that's fine, but among us, is this really so radical? Who's the radical? The person who says, I'm in charge of me, I don't get to initiate force against another person, or the person that says, oh no, that's completely bullshit. I get to initiate force, we all get to initiate force against everybody else. You're not in charge of you, someone else is in charge of you. The president, the majority, the neighbors, the homeowners association, Bill Montgomery, the county attorney, I don't know which position seems more radical. Our position seems very reasonable. Also happens to be the one that works. It's tough times for libertarians, but I've been saying that ever since I've been a libertarian. It's tough times, and it's been tough times, and it's always been tough times for libertarians. To the extent we had libertarians during the Revolutionary War, it was tough times. It's always tough times when you're saying, I'm in charge of me. Why? Because other people want to be in charge of you. 
They want to be in charge of your body, all of your property, your money for sure, your time. So it's tough times. Suck it up. We need to stand up. If we're really for this thing called freedom, do something. There's lots of non-libertarians. I see this as lots of opportunities. Lots of opportunities to present our so wildly radical theory that, hey, you ought to be in charge of you, I ought to be in charge of me. There's big government everywhere. That means there's big government screw-ups, inefficiency, giant problems. I mean, there's nothing they do well. If there's nothing they do well, and they're everywhere, this ought to be easy for us. Pick something the government does, and we can talk about that. I think it could be done better in the private sector, assuming it's something that ought to be done at all. Much of what they do ought not to be done at all. It's easy to be a libertarian, even in tough times. One of my heroes just walked in, Jane Schaefer. Hey, Jane. So I'm not going to take up too much time. But I do want to give seven suggestions on stepping it up for libertarians. Just suggestions. This is just stuff coming from Mark Victor about stepping it up. How are we going to step it up? Are we just going to roll over? Are we going to be super excited that Donald Trump got us a tax cut? Little dinky tax cut, lower the rates, take away this little, little shell game, smoke and mirrors here. Are we excited about that? There's no principle there. Nothing's been accomplished. Taxes are just at the level that the market will bear. That's where they always are, right? The government will take as much money as it can possibly get from you. That's how it works. Suggestion number one. We got to stop fighting with each other over stupid stuff. We got to stop fighting over stupid stuff. And we ought not to have miscommunications. There's just being around the libertarian movement for the last, I don't know, quarter century or so, and being involved in somewhere near half a billion libertarian discussions with 10 or 12 libertarians. <laughs> I've come up with a few things that I think are problems for us. We confuse two important discussions, our two favorite discussions. We have them all the time, no problem. But we got to be clear on what we're talking about. Another one of my heroes just came in. Butler Schaefer is here. A little round of applause for the person who first, first uttered the word libertarian to me. Never heard of it before till Butler Schaefer. Don't listen to Butler. He's too old now. He doesn't make any sense anymore. Anyways, look, there are two major, our two favorite discussions, right? Favorite discussion number one, how would things work in a perfect, ideal, libertarian society? How would we get this? How would we get that? How can we solve all the various problems and still comply with the non-aggression principle? Fantastic, excellent discussion. We should have more of that discussion. But then there's our other favorite discussion, which is, I would title like this. Given that we live in a tyrannical police state, and given that we love to live in a free society, what types of things can we do to move from a tyrannical police state to a free society? Now, that's a completely different discussion. During a discussion like that, somebody might say something like, well, I don't know, maybe we ought to phase out Social Security. I think that's a great idea. But to attack that person and say, aha, you leak as a libertarian. You're for some modified version of a government retirement plan that still has coercion. The answer ought to be, look, man, I'm not talking about my vision of a perfect libertarian society. If you want to talk about that, that's easy. I get the non-aggression principle. I'm not going to force anybody to do anything. That's an easy discussion. But I'm having a different discussion right now. A different discussion. I'm talking about moving in a certain direction. And in that discussion, 
maybe I am a little bit happy about the fact, if this is even true, that I'm going to send in less taxes next year than the year before. I don't know. But if that was true, fantastic. I'm happy that the thief is going to steal a little less from me next year, if that's even true. Everybody understand the point I'm making? Let's clarify which discussion we're having. If somebody is talking about having a limited version of social security program, and this is their vision of a perfect society, great, let's attack them. Let's attack their screwed up philosophy that says robbery is okay, fine. But if they're talking about moving us in a certain direction, let's help. If we can't get along as libertarians, how are we gonna convince non-libertarians that our principle works and makes sense? Suggestion number two, even more divisive among libertarians. And, and I have to admit, I've been guilty of this in the past, and I've changed my view on this. We got to be tolerant of different approaches to freedom, to a free society. Everybody doesn't have to do it my way. I like to rant and rave. I say stuff in court sometimes. I write articles with crazy titles. I do certain things. You might do other things. I don't vote. I'm a really proud non-voter. I didn't even vote for me when I was running for U.S. Senate. I got my blank ballot in my safe at home. I'm a non-voter. I'm happy about that. If you're a voter and you vote libertarian because you're trying to get us to a free society, good for you. I'm not going to bust on you. If you have some construction of something that you vote for the Republican because whatever version of some... I've had libertarians argue to me, I like Trump. Really? You like Trump? Yes, because he's showing everybody that even a complete moron can be president of the United States. And that's a valuable thing to understand for people who think that only brilliant people become the president of the United States. Trump has resolved that controversy for us. Maybe that's a good libertarian point. I don't know. We don't have a central plan to get to a free society. We're generally against central planning, right? It doesn't work in an economic system. Well, it's not going to work in terms of moving us to freedom either. I used to bust on Dr. Jeff Singer all the time for working within the system. I hassled the poor guy for years and years and years. And I'm glad he's not listening to me right now. But you know what? He's moving the bus in the right direction. He's busting it out at Cato. And I appreciate what my brother is doing in a different form than I operate. We got to be more tolerant of different approaches. Number three, look, if you think that this non-aggression principle leads to exactly the same conclusion and would lead to identical societies and communities, you haven't been around the movement long enough. And it's okay. It's all right. We libertarians have some good faith disagreements on how to apply the non-aggression principle. So long as your heart is in the right place and you are calling balls and strikes, you are honestly trying to say this is how the non-aggression principle ought to be offloaded into our society, fantastic. Maybe I got a disagreement with you but I still support you as a libertarian. Can't we envision different libertarian communities with different rules? I mean, is that so hard to envision? You know, maybe the, the Italians, they see things a little differently in terms of the non-aggression principle. Because my friend Alessandro tells me they're just this far away from a complete libertarian society over there. Right, Alessandro? But different communities are going to see things differently. Not everybody has to be exactly the same on this point. We need to be more tolerant of our libertarian brothers and sisters who are honestly trying to unpack and offload the non-aggression principle, but they offload it differently than we do. As long as they're not skewing it, right? You could see something like uh, Senator Pelosi might say, well, uh, I recognize that no one has a right to create a substantial risk of trespass and harm to another person. Therefore, all handguns ought to be banned. We can see that for what it is, right? That's somebody advocating for a position. 
That's not somebody honestly trying to offload the non-aggression principle. Number four, I got news for you. I got it, Mike. Number four, look, the non-aggression principle really doesn't have to be 100% perfect. There are a few issues in the edge, in the edges, on the corners. Maybe we have some disputes on. Okay, do we have to reach 100%? We've solved every problem in society and we can show how the non-aggression principle solves every possible issue before we can conclude it's way better than what we got now. Isn't that the relevant question? Do I have to come up with every market solution to every problem every socialist could ever possibly envision? Is that a reasonable question? That's a question asked by an ignorant person. But it's fine to say, look, okay, let's just say the non-aggression principle gets me 90% of the way. Do you think what we got right now is better than that? I don't think we have to make that argument. Number five, I'm getting into the stuff that really starts annoying me more and more. I mean, do we want to really move the movement forward? Because if we do, we got to get a lot more professional. We got to get a lot more professional. I, I recognize everybody's got their different style and that's fine. But jumping around in a bathing suit with purple hair, celebrating the non-aggression principle, probably isn't going to be the most persuasive way to explain to our non-libertarian brothers and sisters that we got a serious philosophical position. We got to start presenting it in a way that reaches out better, if that's what we really want to do. And if we don't want to do that, then what are we doing? We're just sitting around having an intellectual discussion group, and that's fun, but I'd like to see a freer society before I check out. I got kids. I'd like them to have a freer society than I lived in. And don't get me wrong, I'm happy and grateful for the extent to which we have a free society now. And we all ought to be. This is one of the best times ever. And this is one of the best places on the planet to live. We should recognize that as well. Six, we got to talk about the non-aggression principle, don't we? If you guys are giving speeches or writing articles or talking to people and you're beating around the bush, you're talking about things like marijuana is not harmful and that's why people ought to get to use it. You are doing a disservice to our movement. That is not our argument. I don't care if it's harmful or not harmful. That ain't our position. Our position is, is the person getting ready to ingest it a competent adult? Well, if so, it's their body. They decide. End of analysis. If we don't at least bring that up, how are we advancing our philosophy? We're not. Our, the non-aggression principle and our philosophy is elegant. It works great. We ought not to be ashamed of it. I put it right out in front. My, my End the Drug War article is entitled, Legalize Methamphetamine, with an exclamation point at the end. I'm not ashamed of it. And I'd love to debate anybody on it. And I would, and I have. Talk about it. And then seven. We should be optimistic, and we should be positive, and we should be proud. The reason we ought to be those things, because we're the keeper of the faith. We're keeping the flame alive. And we're right. We're right. We're right for several reasons. We're right because the libertarian philosophy is the most moral way to act, right? I mean, is it a big stretch to say initiating force against your fellow human beings, that's immoral? We, it should, we should have to work very hard to make that case. Our position is the moral position. It's also the position that works best. If you just take a look, you see what's so obvious, free society. High standard of living, unfree society, closer to a third world country, every single time, everywhere you look. 
East Germany, West Germany. How much evidence do we need of this stuff? Everywhere you look, show me a place that's got free markets, free society, protects private property, keeps church and state separate if there is a state, but keeps coercion down or at least says it's wrong. That society is going to do better every single time. We should be proud. We should be positive because we're right. Don't be shy about this stuff. This is really easy to argue. I remember when I first was introduced to this stuff, I felt, oh my God, these are such hard arguments. They're easy arguments. They're really easy arguments. What gives you a right to tell this person what to do? Seems rather obvious. All right, that's my rant for the day. We have absolutely awesome speakers at this thing. If you guys miss even one, I think you do yourself a disservice. So um, given that I'm way over my time, and thank you guys for not chopping me off there, uh, that's all I have to say. I will see you at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning for my talk, which I promise will be radically different than everything that I've said here today. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.